Second generation, the teeth were now every bit as crooked and rotten as they were in his practice back in the States. And the mental fitness had declined further, the physical fitness had declined further, and of course there was a higher rate of high blood pressure, diabetes, and arthritis. His conclusion was, in the absence of good nutrition, deterioration of the species is rapid. And he predicted that the health of the primitive peoples would seriously decline as their diets became westernized. He also predicted a rapid explosion in the rate of diabetes, heart disease, heart disease high blood pressure, arthritis, and other chronic disease which of course all of that has uh, come to pass. Uh, next slide. Now the reason for all of this, we now have uh, know is epigenetics. That's the uh, big term for the fact that the genes turn on in response to the local environment. That is the food that you eat and the toxins you're exposed to will turn your genes on and off. So if I have a diet that's very high in sugar, high in carbohydrates, I will have about 65 genes turn on that rev up inflammation. The inflammation molecules will rev up my arthritis, will rev up all of my diseases that have an inflammatory component, which, by the way, is essentially all of our chronic diseases. High blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, depression, Parkinson's, MS, they all have a large inflammatory component. If, on the other hand, I eat a diet that is rich in non-starchy vegetables, green leaves, whole fruits, and a protein source, whatever protein source that you want, uh, beans and rice or fish, meat, poultry, I turn on 72 genes that downregulate those inflammation molecules and are very healing. So let me repeat that. I eat a diet like the standard American diet, high in carbs. I rev up 65 genes that will drive my chronic disease. Or I eat a diet that's rich in green leaves, whole fruits, and protein source. I turn on a diet that is very healing and downregulates all those inflammation molecules. Okay, and so based on that, one can certainly uh, make the case that it, it's not, what, when you read the paper that we're finding all these genes linked with diabetes, uh, multiple sclerosis, asthma, I, I have a lot of heartburn with that because it, it doesn't acknowledge that's not so much the DNA that's the problem. It's the epigenetics that are turning the genes on that is the problem. For example, you have uh, corn. Well, we're in Iowa. We all know corn. You take a bag of seed corn, you split it in two, plant half of it in good black Iowa dirt, fertilize it. The other half you put on a trash heap. You come back in the fall to make your harvest. The black dirt Iowa corn's gonna have a bumper crop, whatever it is these days, 180 bushels an acre or so. You go to the trash heap corn, what are you gonna see? Yellow, stunted corn, full of brown, fungus, smut kind of stuff. You'll hardly find any kernels, ears of corn whatsoever. It was the same DNA in both fields. It's not the DNA that's the problem. The DNA that you have is not the problem. That's not why we have this epidemic of disease in America. Mutations don't happen that fast. It's the epigenetics that is turning the, our perfectly fine DNA into trouble. Next slide, please. Okay. Our brains have a billion cells in them with about a trillion connections. And within those uh, billions of cells with trillions of connections are trillions of chemical reactions that are needing to happen simultaneously every instant of your life. And all those chemical reactions are dependent on having the correct substrates or building blocks for them to happen. And if the correct building blocks aren't there, Either the reaction doesn't happen or the wrong thing gets made. 
because it has to substitute using the parts that it has. And in general, when a substitution happens, the outcome is, is rarely better. More often than not, uh, it's less effective. So all of these trillions of reactions that we have are dependent on the amino acids, minerals, vitamins, and other phytonutrients, the vast majority of which are essential. That is, we have to eat them. We are not plants, folks. We have to eat most of the things that we use in our body. We can make a few of the things that we eat, but the vast majority of the compounds that we use for our reactions are from things that we have to eat, and we're not eating them. Okay, so if you look at our, if you do a nutritional history, the vast majority of Americans no longer eat the uh, recommended daily allowance, which is not even the requirements for optimal health. It's simply the requirements or, or the average of what people were eating back in the 1930s. And I will tell you, in the 1930s, people were still eating a lot more fruits and vegetables than we are today. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so in, in our brains, we rely on mitochondria. The mitochondria generates the energy for your brain cells to do the work of living. Without mitochondria and without oxygen, your brain dies very quickly. Seconds, minutes, bingo, you die. There are parts of our bodies that can get by without mitochondria for a little while, um, but the, the reality is our brains are so dependent on mitochondria and oxygen that if either one's not around doing a good job, uh, the brain will begin to die. If the mitochondria is only marginally effective, then the brain itself becomes marginally effective. And, I, well, that's enough on that one. Let's take the next slide. Okay, so uh, this is the biochemistry. My med students should just be eating this up, stuff up, right? Okay, now the question for you guys is, so, NADH, FADH. Do you know what you have to eat so you can make NADH and FADH? <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll help you out. I'll put you out of your misery. FADH is, is uh, made from riboflavin or B2. NADH is made from niacinamide or B3. And then the other question I can put on the spot is, do you have any idea what you have to eat to get those? Kale. <laughs> When in doubt, I'll tell you, when in doubt, answer kale, okay? When in doubt, answer kale. You'll, you'll almost always be right. So the B vitamins are in green leaves. Uh, and most of us don't eat nearly enough green leaves. Uh, most of America is very short on our B vitamins. Uh, you also need to have ubiquinone uh, and lipoic acid uh, and antioxidants for the mitochondria to work really well. The ubiquinone, the lipoic acid, are also in the green leaves, uh, and they will be in organ meats, heart, tongue, gizzard, liver, sweetbreads, all those things that our great grandmothers knew to eat, but we somehow forgot. Uh, and the antioxidants are the bright colors. Go on next. Just another version of the same thing. Having a healthy mitochondria uh, or not having a healthy mitochondria is the difference between having, uh, getting two miles to the gallon versus 38 miles to the gallon. And in the brain cell, we have hundreds, thousands of mitochondria per brain cell. So it's a difference between being a snail and a jet liner. Okay, next. Okay, so in addition to making energy, the brain cell will have to wire itself from one cell to the other. Those are called the axons and dendrites. The wiring has to be well insulated so the thoughts can flow smoothly from brain cell to brain cell. If you took the insulation off the wiring in your house, you would get a house fire. We all understand that. If you take the insulation off the wiring in your brain, you get a brain fire or a thought fire. And so you have uh, brain fog, problems with memory, attention, irritability. Uh, Difficulty controlling impulses, you're much more likely if Joe says something annoying, I'll, I'll punch him out rather than remember that he's my boss and you don't punch out your boss. So myelin is very important to keep your, your thoughts flowing smoothly and in order. 